Yeah, he, he, he is an exciting, an exciting prospect. I think we're getting him uh, joining us with with his best years ahead of him. He was in wonderful form uh, for Cirque Bruges last year, and he he got a big move to to Genk. And I think the conversations I've had with him and <clears throat> his people, you know, they're expecting um, him to have a big a big season uh, towards the end of this year and next year and, and build a career similar to a Jonathan David. So <clears throat> he's, uh, he's someone that I think his star is going to, is going to keep, uh, is going to keep building. And um, for Canada, it's, it's just more depth. I think you've seen through this qualification pathway that, you know, three games in, in the windows is challenging for players um, we've came up against some rosters that have been a little bit deeper in in other positions and they've benefited. But Canada is now strengthening there. You know, you've seen with with Kyle Lauren, he's he's had to miss the last window. Junior Hoylet has missed this window and the last through injury. So you know, EK provides us with, uh, with with some real real firepower in in that department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And did you have a follow-up? No, I'll let others ask. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so we'll come around. Um, but Armin from One Soccer, please. Uh, hey, John. Uh, hey, yesterday, Armin. yesterday, uh, Alfonso Davies told us that he had snuck into Commonwealth Stadium as a as a youth uh, in his youth uh, and and without a ticket. Uh, next week, he'll be the primary attraction in front of 40, 50,000 people. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you get asked this question a lot, but on the on the I guess the week leading up to his homecoming, can you maybe reflect on how much you've seen Alfonso grow from from the kid he was when he joined this, the squad to I guess the leader he's now in in your team? <laughs> it's an interesting question because I think there's been so much that that hasn't changed about him. He's he's obviously matured and he he's had some wonderful experiences that I'm sure have shaped him. But I, I really feel he's he's just kept kept his identity. He's he's that kid at heart. When he's in the environment, he's he's playful. He's fun. Um, when he's on the field, I don't think he's changed either. I think what's what he's what what he's really been able to bring is a, a winning mentality and and to speak with that level of confidence. When we when we spoke about this this journey in in a team meeting, um, and we we talked about the the games that we expect to win on the road, and you have Fonzie, you know, speaking up and saying all of them. And and that's 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 his mentality, you know. Coming from Bayern Munich, he can really talk with that level of authority, but also to breed the confidence in the rest of the group that you know anything is possible for this team. So it's uh, you know I haven't seen a massive a massive change because it, you, you don't want Fonzie to change. You you want him to to keep being him and and everything that's good about him, but he is shaping the mentality of this new Canada and and rightly so he's he's been there and done it at the highest levels thank you thank you thank you very much Sportsnet Peter Galindo followed by uh, Slav from Global Edmonton please thanks Richard hey John thanks for doing this as always um kind of piggybacking off of Neil's question, but, you know, based on what you've seen of, of EK, how does he complement your other forwards in the player pool and, and just the team in, in general? Well, I think, I think firstly, we, we've got to learn about him. We, we've got to understand how he fits into our identity and, and who he is as, as a, as a player. I, I think when you bring players into the environment and you put them around other players like Davies, um, David, Laren, Osario, uh, Ustakio, you know, Laria, they tend to bring different parts of each other uh, out. And, and that's, that's what I've seen. It's, 
you know, you can be player A in one environment, but when they come to us, you, you can see something completely different. Um, and that's that's something we've got to learn about EK, you know, during this this window. And that's this window gives us a chance for more training contacts, maybe one or two if we're lucky. Um, but it, it is a window with less games that gives you more time to understand a player like EK in the training environment and see what works for him. But I think what you've seen from from EK is a number nine. He's he's an out and out number nine. He he likes to play, you know, between the two centre centre backs. He he likes to lead the line. He, he he can run behind the line and stretch the line, which which I like. I think that's a it, it's a facet that can help complement other players and the way that we play. Often when we play with that number nine in Johnny or or Kyle. They want to be receiving in those pockets of space off the front, and you know, at times we we get left with a a line that's not stretched. That space doesn't really open up. So I think EK gives us that 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 opportunity. And then you see him; he's an absolute poacher in the box. He's got that uh, just that real predatory instinct between the penalty spot and and goal. He uh, all the goals he scores uh, are just clever movements he gets those positional advantages to um create opportunities in and that's that's what you want from a number nine so and he's young he's young peter he's he's got as i say i think he's going to keep evolving over the next two three years he's playing at one of the top clubs in belgium um and he's got a plan in his mind about you know where he wants to get in his career and you know canada's part of that plan all right, thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go with Global News Edmonton, followed by Globe and Mail, Paul Atfield. Global Edmonton, please. Hey, John. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this. I'm just curious about your schedule leading into these games. Um, when are you and the team going to be in Edmonton? How much time are you going to get to um, get some practice time in at Commonwealth and how important is that to you as a coach to have an opportunity to, you know, get acclimated to the stadium and the turf, that sort of thing. Yeah, we will be there on Monday. <clears throat> the staff will be getting in over the weekend, but you know, the, the guys will arrive on Monday at, at different times. And, and that's been a big part of, you know, going into Edmonton that we can't acclimate across two matches where, you know, we can experience the, the conditions, the stadium, the turf, um, through the training environment, we get to train on that every day, which that's usually unheard of when you're preparing for internationals. And then we get to play two matches on it. So in terms of the game against Mexico, we'll we'll be pretty battle-hardened in, um, in that environment and, and ready for them. And in terms of the preparation, we've we've Put a bit of work in. I mean, I met with the groundskeeper two weeks ago uh, and had a, a good hour on the turf um, with him. He's a, a passionate um, fellow who's uh, an immigrant from Poland and absolutely football daft. So I, I was loving it because he's uh, he's going to do everything he can to to make sure that that uh, the turf is is going to be good for Canada. So. We're excited. We're going to get acclimated. Uh, we feel like there's a city behind us. The Oilers have, have opened up their doors and, and uh, you know, given us access to some of their facilities. Yeah, it's, um, it's an exciting time for us coming into Edmonton. And uh, just to follow up for me, kind of on the note that you brought up, um, knowing that they've already sold, you know, around 40,000 tickets for both games. Um, I would imagine for you personally and for the team, that's got to, you know, add to the excitement for these games, knowing that fans are coming out and supporting you guys. And I mean, you might get, you know, as many as 50,000 plus by the time the games roll around. That's got to make you get a little bit more excited to come down here and play these games. Yeah, it's one of the reasons we we, we came to Edmonton. I was there in 2015 for the Women's World Cup and that moment when Sinclair scored 91st minute. I mean, it was... Uh, it was just an amazing experience. There was a sea of red and it felt like a fortress. When, when you go to Edmonton, you genuinely feel the whole city's behind you. Uh, that's, that's, that's how you feel. From the minute we 
arrived two weeks ago for the site visits. You've got, you know, people, the, the tourism board, you've got all sorts of people wanting to help, that everyone's trying to find a way to help the team. And the fans are no different. You could see how quick the tickets were selling out the other day. Yeah, I mean, getting into that stadium and, and potentially feeling 50,000 people at your back, oh, I mean, that's... I'm sure it's what Fonzie's dreamed of. And, and for many of us, you know, these men, I don't know if they've played in front of 50,000 Canadians. Some of them, they'll have never experienced that before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Global Mail, Paul Eiffel, followed by John Molinero, TFC Republic and CBC. <laughs> hey, Paul. John. I hope you're well. Yeah, I'm good, Paul. Um, just uh, Kyle and Atiba obviously missed out on the last uh, window with, with injury, um, but obviously in, they've got fit and they were back playing in the Champions League. Kyle, Kyle scored in the Champions League. How much is it for your development as a program to have your players playing at uh, top Champions League clubs like Besiktas, but also playing together uh, and developing that chemistry week in, week out that they can bring when they meet up with uh, Canada? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of ways on this of answering. The, the first one is, I think last window was good when you've got some key players missing because the, the team had to adapt and respond in those moments. You're going in uh, the Mexico game in Azteca without two key parts of our, of our jigsaw puzzle. But now they're back for these games. And, and I think that's exciting. Number one is it adds to the competition because there's a group of men that got the job done without them. And now you've got them coming in, you know, pushing, pushing the levels. And I think what, what you're starting to see, Paul, is a, a level of competitiveness within the environment that, you know, guys are coming in with a mentality knowing they have to train well. Uh, they have to get ready coming in, do all the little things to make sure they come in with no niggles. Because, um, yeah, to, to get these moments to play in front of 50,000 fans, you know, we're going to have to work for it. And, and then when you think of Kyle and Atiba, you know, these guys are, are really important to this team because <clears throat> when you look at teams like Costa Rica, you know, they, they'll play with maybe three, four or five guys, and that's their strength that all play at the same club. In, in the Mexico lineup, they'll have three players all playing at the same, same club in the back four. So for us to get these sort of partnerships where – you just know that the, the chemistry is deeper between two guys that are at a club. They've they've battled together to win a, a championship with Besiktas. So, you know, when they're on the field together, I know that they're going to push to another level for each other. But more importantly, it's just that winning experience. You know, to, to win a title in Turkey, and, and if anyone's seen the fan base there, you know, they, they, they're rabid. It's... it's uh, it's a tough environment to, to apply your trade, as I always, you know, Kyle Lauren keeps reminding us how tough it is. Um, so th th that sort of mentality with guys who play in the central spine is uh, is critical to us. So having them back is is brilliant. And, and while we're missing a, a couple of key parts like Junior and Scott Kennedy through injury, um, Charles Andrea Brim, you know, they, we're able to bring two experienced winners back to this team. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, <clears throat> followed by Maxime Fossi from Radio Canada. <clears throat> Thanks, Richard. Uh, hi, John. Uh, good to see you. Thanks, as always, for taking the time to speak to us. Um, just sort of circling back to EK, I was wondering if you could sort of maybe share some insight as to what the process was like in terms of getting him to commit to Canada, because he did have other options. I mean, how... How were you able to sort of sell them on the Canadian program? Yeah, it's been a long, it's been a long process. Um, we, uh, through our regional Excel structure, we were able to find a contact at, at Woodbridge who um, had let, uh, let us know that EK had the potential to play for Canada. This is back in 2018. So we contacted Chelsea's head of recruitment and at the time, they they just stonewalled the opportunity. They were very clear that EK wasn't interested in representing Canada. Although we never got a chance to speak to the the player who was young at the time, they uh, they were very clear he was on a pathway with England, 
and that Canada wasn't an option. So we'd spoke to them about the potential of bringing them into um, one of our matches in 2018 because uh, we were we were bringing a lot of young players in at the time. So that was that was sort of stonewalled, and it's it's just been a process of patience over a, a three year period, and you know the programs come a long way, uh, and I think the the results uh, in recent times has has made a difference, and certainly. You know, some of the players have kept in contact with EK as well. So from all angles, we've we've just kept encouraging them to to keep thinking about being part of this of this journey with us. It's a special journey. Any any player who's contemplating coming into this country know they could be part of a, a generational shift. And and I think that's exciting for, for any young player. And 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 look, John, there's a lot of players out there that you know, I've got dual passports and you've got to keep it real. Like I, I keep seeing all the names that are getting bandied around, but you know, the, the reality is if, if they can play for a bigger association for many of these agents and players, it's about the dollars first. It's a short, this is what I'm learning. It's a short career and they have to maximize their, their earnings during that period of time. And, and then when those opportunities sort of diminish, you know, that, that, that's where you have real conversations. And I was able to have a, a real conversation with, with EK um, quite recently. And it, it, it's been for the betterment of this country. Great. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Good luck next week. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got time for just a couple more. So we'll go with uh, Maxim followed by uh, Joshua, please. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for doing this. I was just wondering about this condensed schedule your players have this year. You know, now this year they play on Wednesdays and weekends with their clubs. Just wondering if fatigue has been a factor before. Yeah, look, I think the fatigue is is a massive part. I mean, if you ask any any of the players, it's it's been a wild a, a wild experience. I think the the big thing we underestimate is. It, it's accumulated load that you've got to look on, look at over. Uh, like we look at from when we started in September, four weeks before, up until November, and we've tracked out what that load looks like for our key players, and and that has huge implications on, you know, one what they're able to do when they arrive in camp, two, you know, who's going to play what games, and when you can expect major decay. Like, like I think the the general fan expects a player to get on the field and they just they run around and that's going to be their top performance that they see every week. But like we understand in the layers of of our players that some are going to decay, their performance is going to drop very quickly in a game. Maybe after twenty minutes, you're going to see a completely different type of player. So they're the layers that that we've we've had to look at. A lot of it's been predictive, but. You know, after the last window, it was very clear, like very clear that, um, you know, the, the players have been suffering big time. Uh, a lot of games prior, Champions League, Europa League, club, and then into a window that is so intense with travel. And, and the travel is the killer. That's, that's the, you know, when these windows are put together, it, it, at times it seems to be like a UEFA-centric concept where, you know, these countries fly an hour to here or two hours there. Our men, after 22 hours, one man's going to fly to get to Edmonton. Even a guy that's in um, in Columbus, so he's got a game this weekend. One guy's got he's got to travel 13 hours to get from the U.S. to Edmonton. Like 13 hours, it's and – then, and then you add <laughs> – he's got to get into training the next day on the Tuesday. And he's recovering from the game on Sunday, and he's got a game on on the Friday. So it, it, it's been a, a journey, um, but but for I think the players they've enjoyed what what they have enjoyed, and they keep reporting is just the the cadence of having two days a game, two days a game instead of having to wait, you know, five days before one game and four days before the next. So that in some ways they've enjoyed it, and then in other ways. Um, yeah, I think they they know that they've got to be pretty uh, pretty bulletproof minded, you know, going from one game to the next physically. Thanks, John. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Josh from The Athletic, please. Hey, John, just another one on EK. He's kind of the, the next player in a long list of dual nationals that, that you've uh, convinced to play for Canada. I'm just curious, over your time having done that, convinced players to play for Canada, what have you learned about what works and what doesn't work when approaching players and, and kind of selling them on Canada? Well, I think I think you've got to get to a point where the conversation's real. Uh, and that's you, you, I've learned that now. I've I've learned over four years that th there's a point where it's not real, and they're using this conversation to project their opportunities in other countries. And we've seen that. We've seen that with a number of players. I, I think that's that's been uh, a, a difficult part of this process, where you know you feel like you're having a genuine conversation with um, <clears throat> the player and their representatives, but it's been, you know, a process that they've, they've used to, to, to get a, an opportunity that they see as better. But, but I think, you know, that that's been part of the learning and, and then understanding that when the conversation becomes real, then you have to make sure that the players understand the opportunity here. Uh, and, and that's, that, that's been, um, you know how how things have gone, but I think on the other side is 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 just the constant contact. I think that's that's been an important part of the process where we've had success. That you know you've been willing to constantly stay in touch, constantly um, track, monitor, um, and 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 celebrate some of their successes, even though they're not part of your program. So you know I think that's been an important part of of what we've done and. Yeah, it's it's definitely <clears throat> you know when you when you're a young a young lad you know aspiring to be a you know football you think you know playing for a country is the you know the most important thing on your on your bucket list. But I think again in the professional era, there's big opportunities to represent a country like England commercially, huge opportunities, and um, you know at some point Canada will get there. We, we'll get to that level of opportunity. And I think, you know, you're seeing someone like Ayuakinola switching over from the US to, to Canada. You know, that, that was a, a, one of them that was pretty much a heart decision. You know, it wasn't a, a head decision because I think Ayo had a big opportunity with the US to become, you know, maybe their leading number nine. But, um, you know, there's a, a, a guy who wants to be part of this generational shift. And I think Ike, the same. I mean, he could have easily went to Nigeria, but it was pretty clear he wants to be part of this this journey, this this brotherhood we've created with this young group of men and and uh, to take a country somewhere it's never been before and, and to have that experience. That doesn't come around very often in people's football careers. Thank you very much. And uh, John, we'll just leave you with one um, final question um, and would note that uh, tickets are, are still on sale for the upcoming match. Uh, as noted at the top, we're closing in on 40,000 plus for each of these two matches. But what would you like to see, John, from the sea of red, the, the Canadian supporters, uh, when they come out to these two matches uh, at Commonwealth Stadium? Well, well, I keep saying this to my players. We, we have to to get our performance right first. We, we have to bring our intensity. Uh, we, we have to, you know, look to own the ground that we're on. And, and by doing that, it's, it's, it's playing our way. And, and if, if we play our way, the fans come with us. If, if we show our commitment, the fans come with us. It, it's happened in Toronto now in the last two matches we've played there for sure, or three matches. And, there's a great opportunity for the people of Edmonton to be part of history. I mean, that's, that's what this is. I mean, it'll be hopefully, you know, where were you when, and, and that's, that's the opportunity these fans have. We, we just have to control our own business, which is we have to perform. And when we do, we know the fans will come with us.